Good morning, everybody. It is always good to be here with you. Um, I didn't have the honor of graduating from this school, but I do feel a, such a connection with you. I have a number of colleagues who have graduated from here, but um, the work you guys are doing is phenomenal, and we, we support you 100%. In the last two years, we were able to uh, give a scholarship, a $1,000 scholarship to students here for service, and we call it the Dave Fitzpatrick Scholarship. Uh, Dave Fitz was one of my deacons, and Dave has been with the Lord some time now, and Dave had a passion for serving, and uh, he loved working with young men and mentoring young men. And a quick story, uh, this past December, I, I finished 10 years pastoring the church in Glen Olden, and it's been a phenomenal 10 years. When I interviewed that same guy, Dave Fitzpatrick, was a, a board member. Now, at that time, the church had no diversity, and the church had never had a black pastor before. So when I interviewed, I said to myself, well, we need to have an honest conversation. Someone say amen. Like, we could be holy if we want, but sometimes we need to have an honest conversation. So I asked the deacons a question. And at that time, they're good men, they're still good men, but even at that time, there was no diversity on my deacon board. And I said to the brothers, I says, have you guys considered the fact that if you present me as a black man to be this church's next pastor, you may lose some members? Have you thought about that? And the room got real quiet. You know, some of the brothers were looking up to the ceiling. Mm. Some looking at their toes. Mm. But that same man, Dave Fitz, he said, well, Pastor Brown, let me tell you this. He said this, and Dave was a white man. He said, if they want a white pastor, they can find a white pastor. But we're interviewing you. Praise God. That said to me, something's happening in that church. Um, so we're just so glad to be part of what you guys are doing. Where's my boys? Where's my doorman? Talk to me, guys. Make some noise. Make some noise. Amen, amen, amen. Well, let's, let's get into the word of God today. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 7 through 11. Word of God says, Dear friends, let us love one another because God because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. A God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. I want to speak to you this morning for a few moments on the topic, the evidence of God's love. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity of being here today. And Lord, I pray that you would speak and we would hear your voice. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have two grown children. My daughter is 30 and my son is 26. I have two grandsons. When my kids were young and we uh, raised them in Philadelphia, when my kids were young, uh, my wife and I would take them to the Black History Museum in Philadelphia. During this time of the year, February, Black History Month, we would sit down together and watch the various documentaries and shows that talk about black history. I have to admit to you, though, that at times, Black History Month was and is challenging for me because you see those documentaries, they depict what life was like for black people at one time in our nation. And that affects me personally. Now, we have to admit that things are much better for black people today, but racism is alive and well. So, what is the answer to the solution in our nation? Well, in 1957, Dr. Martin Luther King preached a sermon on the topic, Loving Your Enemies. 
In the sermon, Dr. King said this. He said, we must discover the power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. He said, love is the only way. Listen, I do believe we need judicial and legislative changes so the scales of our justice system will be even for all people. And I also, I also believe that people should be held accountable for their actions. But my friends, those things can't change a person's heart. Only the love of God through Jesus Christ can change a person's hearts. Dr. King was right. Love is the only way. You see, when a person truly understands the depths of God's love for them, it can change how they think about themselves and it can change how they treat others. So my text is from the first epistle or letter of the apostle John. Now he should not be confused with John the Baptist, but this is the John who was one of our Lord's original disciples. This is the John who also wrote the gospel of John and Revelation. His brother was James and along with Peter, the three of them were a part of our Lord's inner circle. John's objective for writing the letter was to strengthen the church against false teachers, to recall the fundamentals of the faith and to encourage them to love, to love. John says that real love is from God. And if we are truly Christians, we must love people as God has loved us. And my friends, if we are not doing that, it shows that there's a spiritual problem. One commentator put it this way. He said, this is not rocket science. Since God is love, an absence of love in your life reveals an absence of real fellowship with God. He said, it indicates that you don't know God like you claim you do. You see, we may claim we love God and we may claim we love others, but what is the evidence of that love? Words are cheap. Christian or house Christians can be, we love everybody. Love your brother, love your sister. It sounds good, but my question is, what is the evidence of that love? I heard a story about a wife who chose a unique way to test the evidence of her husband's love. She faked her own kidnapping and even sent the husband a ransom note. When the husband called the police and they got involved, the, the cops realized that her kidnapping was a hoax. And they asked the lady, why did you do this? And she said this, I wanted to find out what my husband would do for me. You see, although she went to the extreme, she was just looking for evidence of her husband's love. In our text, John will give us three evidences of God's love. Number one, God's love is seen. Love ones, we want to make changes in our nation and, and race relations. We as people of God must make sure that the love of God is seen. God's love is seen. God's love for us is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. God sent Christ in person to save us. John said in verse 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might be we might live through him our heavenly father loves us he loves you and he showed us our, his love by sending his son christ to die for us that is the evidence of 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 god's love and i say to you this morning young people like our heavenly father let that just be how we love people that they see god's evidence of love in us. And how do we do that? How is God's love seen in us? By what we say, by what we do. 
and by our attitudes. Secondly, we'll see that God's love is selfless. It is selfless. One definition of the word selfless is being willing to give unselfishly to others. The Bible says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave, he gave his only begotten son. Whomever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave. He was selfless. He gave. God saw our sinful and lost condition and out of love, he unselfishly gave us his son. And loved ones, what amazes me about God's selfless love is that God sent Christ to die for us, not because we were good, not because we deserved it, but because he saw our need and he loved us. Knowing that we would sin, knowing that we would turn our backs on him, knowing that we would break our promises to him, yet he still sent his son. That is evidence of the selfless love of God. I'll admit to you that it's not always easy to love people selflessly. Who knows, folks can get on your last nerve. Somebody say amen. Amen. Sometimes you want to talk about their mama, but you know, you saved, you can't do it. Can I get a witness, somebody? Folks can get on your last nerves, and I understand it is hard, but this is the deal, loved one. Since God loves us with a selfless love, we must love other people in the same way. So preacher, what what does selfless love look like? A selfless love is not being so defensive. And taking things so personally. A selfless love means that you emphasize what what others are going through. Empathy is the ability to step in another person's shoes and try to understand what they're going through. It is not pointing a, a, a judgmental finger. It is not talking behind their back. But once we understand what they're going through, we use that information to guide our thoughts and our actions and to show them love. So, loved ones, when we are interacting with someone who may be hard to love and we want to cut them off, we must remember that when we were hard to love and when we are hard to love, God never cuts us off. Amen. Amen. So, God's love is seen, God's love is selfless. And third, God's love is sacrificial. One definition of sacrifice is the surrender of something for the sake of something else. Verse 10 says that love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, we are guilty of sinning against God. And because God is a just God, We deserve to be punished. We were lost unless someone came and paid the price to satisfy the righteous judgment of God. But the only sacrifice that could be acceptable to God was the death of his son. So he sacrificed his son. The sacrificial love of God is found in the free gift of Jesus Christ so that we may be forgiven of our sins and spend eternity with them. Loved ones, that is the evidence of God's sacrificial love for you. He gave his son that you may have everlasting life. And John tells us that in the same way God loves us, we must love one another. And that love must be seen, that love must be selfless, and that love must be sacrificial. When we love people in this way, even though they've hurt us, even though from the physical eye they don't deserve it, when we love people that way, we show the evidence that we too belong to God. We 
too. I remember, I remember when, when I graduated from undergrad, I got to watch my time. When I graduated from undergrad and I was working in sales, I was working downtown Philadelphia and, and, and in this sales position, we, we had to do uh, like a demo, uh, uh, a sales demo, you see, to, to move on to the next level. And I did my demo and, 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 and my manager saw what I did and, and he wanted to give me an award. So there was this big event. The company was bringing people in from all over the country and the place was full and, and, and I was going to get that award that night. But the problem was it was an open bar. So folks were drinking and getting drunk. And I remember, I'll never forget this, I, I got up and I, I got up, I, you know, I had my little degree, I, I, I had my little suit, I, I had my little briefcase, I, I thought, oh, I finally made it, I finally get respect. Oh, they didn't respect my dad, they didn't respect my mom, but they got to respect me. And I remember getting up and walking up the aisle to get my award and one of my colleagues, one of the members of that company was drunk. And he said, there goes that, and he used the N-word. The whole place heard it. My manager was crazy, man. He's Barry, what do you want to do? Do you want him fired? I said, no, let me talk to him. Now, at that point, y'all, I was saved. Glory to God. <laughs> and he came to me, and he started to apologize. And he began to tell me why he did what he did. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, I'm a different man today than I used to be. And I was able to show him the love of God. That's what I'm saying to you, loved ones. I know it's hard sometimes, but if you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we have a mandate. Love people like God has loved us. Notice said that when the apostle John was in his old age, when he was so weak that he had to be carried to the church buildings, at the end of the meeting, they would take him up to the head and they would encourage him to give words to the church. And every week, old John would say the same thing. He would say, little children, let us love one another. Little children, let us love one another. Week after week after week, he would say the same thing. The disciples begin to grow weary of the, the same words every time. And finally they ask him, this is why do you say the same thing over and over again? And John said, because it is the Lord's command. And he said, if it is the only thing that is done, he said, then that's enough. Just love each other. He was referring to what Christ said to him and the other apostles in John chapter 13, verse 34, when Jesus says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I has loved you. You should love each other. That's a commandment, loved ones. Oh, maybe you grew up like me because my mama said, somebody hit you, you do what? Hit him back. I get it. I get it. I get it. But Christ says, you're a new person. You've been changed. You've been renewed. You've been filled. He says, love people as I have loved you. And as John wrote this letter to the churches from a pastor's heart, young people, I'm speaking to you this morning from this pastor's heart. The most important thing you can do above your outreaches, above your ministry, above serving this church or serving the school or serving the church, the most important thing you can do is love people as Christ has loved you. That will make the difference. That love must be seen. It must be selfless. It must be sacrificial. I'm going to ask someone to come and play quietly on the keyboards for me as I prepare to close. The doctrine of love was the core value to the civil rights movement that gave black Americans freedom and equality. Dr. King said this, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that.
And Jesus said that we are the light of the world and that we are to love people as he has loved us. So my friends, in this age of hatred and division, we must come against spiritual darkness that's all around us with the powerful love of Jesus Christ and the liberating light of the cross. I think about Malcolm X. I think about, see, there was two groups during the 60s. You had the civil rights movement with Dr. King and the non-violent group, and you had Malcolm X and, and the Nation of Islam and the Black Panther movement, and Malcolm X movement was by any means necessary. But I believe if we look back on history, we will see that the movement that changed the world, the movement that changed the hearts of those in the White House was the one that had a core value of love. Pastor J.D. Greer said, may our prayer in life desire be this. As God has been to us, may we be to others. Let's love people as God has loved us. Let's forgive people as God has forgiven us. Let us show grace to people as God has shown grace to us. I close with this. The night before Dr. King was killed, he gave a speech. And the speech actually was somewhat prophetic. He was actually saying in a speech he was ready to die. And the last part is this. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter to me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. Now I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not, I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I looked over. And I've seen the promised land. Now, I might not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy this evening. I'm not worried about anything and I'm not fearing any man. Why? My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let God use you to make a change in this generation. Let your goal to be used by God and his will be done in your life. God bless you. Pastor.